Welcome to the Clear to Send podcast, a podcast about wireless engineering, where we educate you on Wi-Fi technology, talk about design tips, troubleshooting, interviews, and the tools. Here are your hosts, Roel and Francois. This show is happily sponsored by Metageek. Wi-Fi is awesome when it works, but when it doesn't, the problem is usually a mystery. Unless you have Insider Office by Metageek. Insider Office quickly scans your wireless environment and recommends ideal channel selection to help you make your Wi-Fi awesome and keep it that way. Check out the solutions at medigeek.com to get started and get your Wi-Fi working the way you want it to. Hi, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Clear to Send podcast. We have a guest interview here. It's going to be an exciting topic, I think, because it's uh, it's outdoor wi-fi but before we get to that we have our co-host francois how are you francois i'm very good how are you royal i'm doing good doing great i think this is going to be an interesting episode do you agree oh yeah yeah i think we're going to learn a tons from this one i'm actually excited about it yeah so am i and and what we have on the show today is jeremy ward from Transit Wireless, who's going to go into a very interesting project at New York City. Jeremy, why don't you introduce yourself to the listeners? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Jeremy Ward. I'm a senior wireless engineer for Transit Wireless in uh, in uh, New York, New York. Um, we are a neutral carrier operator that operates uh, all cellular and Wi-Fi, as well as public safety data services within the New York City subway system. Nice. How did you get started into this field? So I was in the IT field initially working uh, in for a, actually a division of Altel that was focused on the financial services element. And this was around 98 or so, 99. And, you know, as we know, 802.11 prime was uh, kind of, well, B was kind of introduced around then. And, you know, I was very interested in this. And at the time I was into, uh, uh, you know, into DJ oriented music like, uh, you know, house and, and dance music and had a website for uh, that had hosted a lot of content and was we were streaming out video. And I got interested in trying to figure out a way to be able to connect uh, um, one of the clubs that was in the city that I lived in back to my house where we had a nice you know SDSL Internet connection because we hosted our own server. So I started uh, looking at closely at 802.11b and uh built an outdoor network uh back then to uh to, to basically deliver internet and uh in video back to our media server um and then did a lot of learning and reading and uh and playing around with the technology um to the point where i started to uh uh you know to have come up with a couple of ideas i lived in a rural part of the country in uh in northwestern vermont which was very underserved from a broadband perspective so um, over over a few years, I worked on developing a business plan, refining my wireless uh, skills specifically in, in outdoor public Wi-Fi, um, as well as fixed wireless proprietary uh, technologies, and uh, ultimately wrote a business plan and got funding to build a wireless internet provider um, that served about 1,200 subscribers and provided one of the larger public hotspots uh, in that area at the time. Wow, uh, yeah, that's a lot of uh, customers there for for a company to be Certainly. able to provide Wi-Fi as a service to, to people and generally in areas where there isn't broadband available, right? Absolutely. Uh, we were uh, kind of a two sides of the same coin, you know, where Wi-Fi was a, was a public access technology that anybody could turn, you know, could turn on and sign on to it was a paid service uh, that covered a large swath of the public areas uh, in Burlington, Vermont and around surrounding cities. Um, but we were also, like as, as I mentioned, a rural broadband operator that used a, a hyperman uh, type of technology to be able to deliver fixed wireless, um, trying to avoid the so-called hidden node problem um, with 802.11. So, it, but that was the where the, the bulk of the subscribers were located. We had a lot of seasonality to our Wi-Fi network. However, uh, you know, we covered marinas and campgrounds and what have you um, that uh, you know brought in seasonal subscribers. Gotcha. So, so how did this New York project come to your plate, and what kind of drove this project? Because it sounds like a very large uh, task to take on for you know the city of uh, New York, uh, New York City, and and there's subway riders and 
just can't imagine how you even begin doing a project like this of this scale. Absolutely. Uh, so there was an RFP that was issued, um, you know, by the MTA as a kind of to try to establish a way to del- to deliver communication services, being cellular and Wi-Fi, um, to the underground subway stations. And this was. Um, you know, the MTA is a very large organization and they were looking for a single contact that could manage all of the carrier relationships, um, as well as manage, uh, whoever provided the Wi-Fi public access service or the respondent would provide the service themselves. Um, Transit Wireless, uh, was one of the respondents and the successful bidder for that project. Uh, the project was driven, uh, or the, the, the initial desires were to be able to enable, um, cellular coverage underground, um, you know, by the four major mobile network operators and, you know, the technology that lends itself uh, most uh, economically at this scale for this is, uh, is analog DAS. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we uh, built a financial model around delivering a neutral DAS service um, and had an additional overlay of Wi-Fi as well as 4.9 gigahertz public safety on top of that. So, you know, the, the economic model behind this is very much uh, tilted towards the uh, carrier services side, um, where we're delivering the RF um, from actually five different uh, centralized base station hotels, which are kind of like data centers for uh, remote radio heads and small cells. Um, and then from there, we, uh, we have a fiber network that delivers, uh, uh, you know, drops off strands to every underground station to deliver the actual RF component. Um, we have what are called RFNs that are in the stations and those deliver, um, all of the, uh, the various different, uh, component carriers that the uh, mobile operators use over a combined RF, uh, you know, system, actually over an RF cable system, um, that, uh, it operates in SISO mode. And, and right away, the, the biggest challenge I see is bringing this underground. What other challenges did you guys have uh, as far as like Wi-Fi goes, uh, in bringing so, Wi-Fi to the subway system? Certainly. Um, the subway system, anybody who's ever been in, in New York City knows it's very dirty. Um, it's also uh, very noisy and very hot. Um, and then during the winter, it's wicked cold for some reason, <laughs> uh, even though you think you'd be underground, but you're not. So, you know, the environmental aspect is from a from a thermal uh, and mechanical perspective it is a major element to be considered. Uh to give you an idea, our the operating temperature requirements we have uh, for most of our EPs is between negative 40 Celsius and plus 65, so up to almost 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. So, you know, that's a, and we do see temperatures that, uh, that peak around that, and then certain parts of the network, um, you know, on the low end, uh, we've seen as low as negative five Celsius because obviously this equipment generates its own heat. So that's one element of it. Um, mm-hmm. The other side is we look at um, you know, it, it, the intrusion of our of our our, our mortal enemy, uh, brake dust. Um, you know, trains have a lot of brakes on them, and there's I believe three different types of brake components or, or materials that are used on brake pads in the subway system. Some are ceramic, some are metallic, and some are a fusion of both. And you know, anybody who's worked with with RF knows that that uh, metal dust is not your friend. So mm-hmm. you know, protecting equipment from that is an element is one challenge the other challenge is uh the stations are washed down with pressure washers and that means we have to prevent uh you know moisture and uh you know and actually jetted water from getting into the equipment so we've designed our own uh um, enclosures to hold our our equipment in um that including the aps and what have you and then you know the the biggest challenge which I, you know anybody who's lived in new york city maybe during the 90s especially and earlier uh, is vandalism um, we in fact had to be able to build our antennas, uh, in our enclosures so they could withstand a baseball bat. And <laughs> we actually tested them with a baseball bat to give you an idea. So it's a very, very challenging environment from an RF perspective. Um, we have a lot of reflections, um, trains are, you know, 500 foot long tin cans, uh, that generate a lot of multipath. Um, and they also, uh, you know, uh, also attenuate the signal severely when they roll through the station. So we have to, uh, you know, that's the other challenge. Um, mm-hmm. So there, there's, it's, it's kind of the, uh, the worst possible combination of elements to build this type of network in. 
so, so like in a typical station, where would you put the AP, the antenna, um, and then how would you, you know, where would you face the RF? So in a typical, you know, network, uh, you know, we're taking an omnidirectional pattern. Um, okay. We, uh, we are a high density network, um, but we have just not a lot of vertical clearance. So, you know, our APAs are typically in the station within an enclosure, not too far from the antenna. Okay. And so do you have APs inside the trains? Uh, not at this stage. Um, although okay. in the future, you never know. Yeah, okay. that'll be a challenging one to, to tackle there as a train's moving and then you know being able to hear other access points at the station. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, on the physical layer and the data link layer, absolutely. Um, but, you know, think of it this way. We have five data centers. You know, if you go into a data center, or sorry, into a station in Queens, let's say, which is on one data center or BSH in transit wireless speak, um, you know, and you ride across the East River uh, into uh, and take the train down to downtown, you know, lower Manhattan, um, you've now crossed three different base stations and you need to maintain the same IP address um, mm. throughout that to maintain a session. So that in itself is, is its own challenge. Mm. Yeah. So basically maintaining IP connectivity, you know, a consistent session for, you know, a user when they start in Queens and move down, you know, on, on a train and get off in uh, uh, in downtown or in Lower Manhattan, you know, is a big challenge because you cross three different data centers, and you know, like most networks, our uh, our IP subnets are are aligned with our VLANs, and we have multiple VLANs uh, in the station, but you know, typically our access VLANs are allocated per station, mm -hmm. so that that in itself is a challenge, and. You know, and on a small scale, it's uh, it's it's something that I suppose we you know it's not too difficult to figure out if you know what you're doing. But the concern comes is you know that we have such an immense amount of users on the network, even as it is today, without mm -hmm. it being bored. That when you throw the onboard element on it, um, you know we could see say, like to, you know on any given day we might peak at four hundred thousand sessions. Um, but we expect that behavior to change. You know, if we were to start delivering services to the trains as well. So there's a lot of elements, not just a physical and data link element, but a lot of just basic networking uh, concerns, you know, at the uh, at the protocol layer to be concerned with. Yeah, so, so go ahead. Go ahead, Francois. No, I was going to ask, how long did it take to deploy the network? Um, and are you still, like, today are you still deploying new APs and new stations? Or how does it work? If a new station is coming up, do you guys follow up and, and install the APs at the same time? Well, so what we did is we are we completed our underground build uh, two years ahead of schedule. Um, unusual, uh, you know, but uh, we've been a very successful public-private partnership. We don't very often bring new stations online underground unless uh, one is to be have been rehabbed and brought up uh, or reopened, like in the case of one that uh, uh, is in Brooklyn, I believe that just the other day was reopened by the uh, by the MTA. But typically. Uh, you know, I guess the underground build portion of it is complete. We're doing some work on above ground stations, which is a whole different RF environment to operate in. And, and honestly, if, you know, from an, you know, if an environmental perspective is obviously another uh, world altogether um, because we have to deal with the solar effects of, you know, um, an above ground station since they're largely open. So, but when we build them, uh, you know, we build the stations uh, typically in a, a very short period of time. Um, there's obviously, you know, many months of design concerns and uh, approval processes that have to go into that before we can even uh, put the first screw into something. But uh, that's a, you know, and then we also have we, you know, we feed all of our stations um, with fiber, so we have to uh, determine our fiber paths to get into the station, and then you know, there's, there may be some directional drilling involved or what have you to bring conduit in. Uh, to actually get everything on our network since, uh, you know, again, the economics that drive this are the DAS and the carrier services. With the amount of users that are just you know, going through your network, how do you design for, how do you properly design for your wireless network? Or is it mainly around coverage and, and the capacity of determining, okay, the MTA told us this many people come through the station. So you design based on that number. Do you also design based on, what what kind of applications people are using? I'm assuming if people are traveling through, they're probably using social media or even YouTube or Netflix uh, on their wireless network. Yeah, so 
you know, the first evolution, so we've had seven phases of construction underground, um, and there's been a little bit of a tweak uh, it's happened uh, as those phases went forward. So um, the original design or requirement through our contract uh, with the MTA was driven around um, spot coverage for the Wi-Fi. Uh, and that was very early on. Um, as we built and as, as the relationship evolved and other requirements were added, um, for instance, delivering the 4.9 gigahertz public safety network, our requirements, uh, you know, changed and the Wi-Fi network, uh, you know, RF design requirement was uh, was revised. Um, and, you know, we have started to see more information about utilization. Um, so it was a, it was a coverage play, but there was obviously a capacity consideration um, with that, you know, in mind, we see uh, at very detailed level how our network is used. Uh, we use uh, Procera Networks DPIs for management and, uh, and and analytics, and plus we also run uh, since we run Extreme Networks, formerly Motorola APs. We see uh, we have their analytics platform running, so we actually see a lot of data that tells us how people use it. And believe it or not, you know, a typical mobile network sees about twelve times higher uh, mobile mobile data use, or sorry, mobile video usage than we see. We see about five percent of our traffic any type of mobile video, be it Netflix or YouTube or what have you, YouTube mm-hmm. being the top of that category, like most networks. Um, but on the social media side, Facebook is, again, number one, just like it is everywhere else from a traffic perspective. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a concern. And, you know, when you think about it on a daily basis, um, we do about a, a Super Bowl and a half worth of traffic. Um, and that's an immense amount, but we do it in very small sessions of a couple megabytes at the most. Mm. So the, if you, you know, it's very, very, uh, bursty traffic. People are checking their email. They're checking their news, their news feed. They're listening to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to a, maybe a podcast or what have you, uh, or downloading it to get ready to listen to it on the train. So the traffic is very bursty. It's, you know, very, very short sessions. Okay. So, you know, a coverage design is one thing. Um, we've, uh, recently gone through, uh, some, some design revisions, some architectural changes to address the, uh, capacity needs as they grow. Um, you know, we're, we majority of our network as it is, uh, right the second is 802.11n. Um, we are rolling out phase two or sorry, wave two, uh, 802.11ac, uh, with four by four, um, on, you know, on both bands. And what that's going to do for us is ultimately allow us to, uh, increase data rates, of course. Um, and since we're using uh, a Broadcom based chipset on the APs, this allows us to take advantage of some of these proprietary uh, MCS rates that exist within uh, the 2.4 gigahertz, just specifically on the Broadcom side. Um, our users are very much handset bound. Um, uh, 97% of uh, the network uh, devices are mobile devices, be it Android or iOS. Sorry about that. Be, uh, be it Android or iOS. So we see a lot of. Um, you know, a lot of Broadcom chipsets in the network. So, you know, that's part of addressing the capacity element that uh, we're, you know, that we need to be concerned with. Also, uh, we're starting to look at doing, taking a sectorized approach uh, to the network construction. So, you know, as we upgrade, uh, we we try to do things like, you know, add additional APs within the box um, that, uh, that while we're before, because of the size of the AP, we can only accommodate one. Now we can maybe do two uh, or even three, depending on uh, on the the AP box we're talking about. So initially, it was a coverage play. Uh, very much today, uh, through upgrades and any new builds that may happen, is very much focused on capacity. Okay, and you said you had used you, you guys use Extreme Networks for your access points. That's correct. Uh, we actually uh, it's actually Motorola, uh, you know, which you know Motorola's. Wing platform, uh-huh. uh, which became Zebra, which became Extreme Networks. So it's not the original Extreme uh, product line that's used, like say in you know in Gillette Stadium or Abbey. Okay, and how did you guys determine which platform you're going to go with? Uh, I'm sure you guys looked at all the different vendors. How do you guys determine uh, this is the vendor we go with, or maybe that's the hardware you guys use at Transit Wireless? Uh, I, I mean, honestly, that that predates me. Um, okay. But my, it, a lot of it was was driven around the environmental requirements um, and support for uh, you know for public safety bans and what have you. Gotcha, gotcha. 
and they also have their built-in analytics into their into their system so that that might that's probably like a plus for you guys as you're trying to figure out utilization on the network correct uh you know uh, we use their insight platform and uh it's very very powerful um we have a uh, commercial and carrier services that run on the network, uh, starting to more and you know, more and more every month. Uh, so for instance, let's say we have a, a commercial application, like a, a business user, an example, a, a newsstand inside of a the subway. And we want to understand, uh, you know, a report around slow throughput, mm-hmm. you know, this is all hypothetical. So bear with me. Um, we can go back into insight and take a look at the, uh, um, at the RF matrix trend and go back to some arbitrary period in time. And look at what the transmit receive data rates are, the retry percentages, um, SNR values, RSSI values, et cetera, as the uh, AP uh, observed it from the uh, from the MAC address. Now, you know, in, in a matter of a week, we might say see a million and a half devices. So it's an immense amount of data to keep track of. So retention policies are very, very important in our world. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the analytics platform is absolutely essential for our network this size. And how do you guys handle redundancy? Because I'm sure with public safety riding on that network, uh, you got you guys must be using controller based hardware, or is oh, this absolutely okay. uh, controller based? Uh, and we are actually our controllers are clustered and uh, located in each base station hotel. Um, since we have five base station hotels, it's a total of ten controllers that are dedicated to uh, to the uh, to the access network. Um, we have other controllers that are used for analytics like Insight or for staging or what have you. Have you guys considered using like, a cloud management service? Like, is that Was that on an option or on the table or did it not meet no. certain requirements? Yeah. So, you know, in our world, uh, the amount of users that we see, even per AP, is just absolutely absurd. Um, so it doesn't make sense for the size of the network, in my opinion. Uh, to look at a cloud-based approach when, you know, there's, there's real estate, uh, to put things in and there's, there's really no desire for anyone here to rely on, uh, our DIA connections to, uh, sustain, a, you know, a, uh, you know, our, our APs. It just doesn't make any sense, I think, from a, um, from a, from a network perspective. At some point, I think you get to a point where you hit a critical mass where you need to concern yourself with, you know, actually, capitalizing the infrastructure and support elements, mm-hmm. you know, like a, like a controller and having that on, uh, you know, on site or not on site necessarily, but within your, uh, your network. And mm-hmm. for us, our controllers are centralized in our base station hotels, um, and not on site, like per branch office, if you were to think more of an enterprise model. Okay. Um, but you know, they can, they're not, uh, the APs themselves, uh, wing is, is resilient in the sense where if a controller was to, uh, lose its mind or go or completely be severed from the network. Um, we have a cluster, obviously, so uh, the second one would come up uh, online and manage it. Uh, um, but, you know, in addition to that, if we lose both, uh, they can continue to operate indefinitely um, as there's one of the APs in that, in the, you know, in the in an RF domain is considered a uh, domain manager. So which kind of functions like a controller from a from a statistics and and, uh, and, tra- and management standpoint. But you know, the other thing when you deal with a network of this size is I'm a, I'm a firmly a believer in separating your data in your uh, signaling plane. So in our world, our controllers are never part of the data plane. Uh, they're simply, uh, you know, management uh, uh, platforms, you know, more or less akin to a signaling platform, mm-hmm. especially uh, where our AAA comes into play. So, you know, I, I, I think that uh, that's an important element, I, you know. I've heard arguments for and against um, taking this approach, but you know we 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 know what we see today from a from a transfer perspective and the quantity of users and devices, and you know the concurrency rates are you know insane. We see sometimes up to seventy one thousand concurrent devices on the network wow. uh, during peak rush hour. So for us to go in and look at uh, at, at controllers uh, controlless or, or cloud based strategy, I don't think makes much sense. Wow. So you mentioned the amount of users that you get on an AP. Like, what are those numbers like? Are you getting, like a, are, are they melting an AP? Because there's so many people connected to it. What's that number you guys see? And then do you guys make changes because of that number? So, you know, long and long and the short of it is that, uh, you know, the, the, the highest I've seen in my own eyes 
um, was 150 um, across two radios. You know, keep, keep in mind that these are very small sessions, very small amount of transfer. Right. Um, you know, we do a lot to optimize our network from a basic rate perspective, from an RF transfer perspective. We algorithmically manage transfer power, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a channel plan in play. We do frequently survey uh, and, uh, and validate the network. So, and the other thing is, since it's largely underground, uh, you know, our isolation is so great that we don't have a lot of the pollution that's seen in other portions of the world, you know, where you see 2.4 is absolutely useless, especially in a metro area like New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that, you know, in that respect, uh, you know, we still have to, it, it's almost, it's much cleaner spectrum, but we still have to manage it differently. Right. So as we have uh, started to design and build the above ground, you know, our, our, our RSSI design, our threshold for design changed, you know, it's considerably more aggressive. Um, and, you know, we don't expect to see the kind of concurrency, but as we do this, this, uh, this fifth generation upgrade, as we're calling it to, uh, 8211 AC, uh, we did an extensive amount of, uh, validation testing to try to understand, you know, from a wave one device, what did we see from a performance perspective, uh, you know, of a, of a wave one AP versus a wave two AP. And try to understand, uh, you know, using an extensive set of lab tests and field tests and field trials, as well as DPI data to help us understand really which one performed the best for us. So, you know, to manage this number of concurrent users. So the strategy going forward is to add additional, uh, you know, higher order modulations, uh, add additional transmit receive chains. And it's not so much because there's mobile devices out there that have more than two by two MIMO. It has more to do with uh, transmit receive diversity. Uh, in mm -hmm. the in the environment that we're in, so let's utilize our RF to the maximum amount possible. Let's optimize our data rates, get rid of any BPS or BPSK or QPSK rates. Um, you know, let's minimize our uh, management frame overhead. Um, you know, as well as uh, let's get ready to start trying to uh, you know sectorize a bit. Um, but you know, the impacts that we've seen, uh, I'd say it's pretty typical during rush hour for a really heavy used AP to maybe deliver. Uh, you know, no more than 35 to 50 megabits a second. Hey, everyone. Let's take a break to think about Wi-Fi for a moment. It's awesome when it works, right? But when it doesn't, the problem is usually a mystery. If you're sick of simply rebooting your devices and crossing your fingers every time your Wi-Fi goes down, let the Wi-Fi experts at Metageek make the invisible visible. Their powerful diagnostic solutions visualize interference from external Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi sources and will help you configure your wireless network for maximum coverage and throughput. From a weekend enthusiast to an enterprise IT professional, MetaGeek has everything you need to make Wi-Fi awesome and keep it that way. Check out their solutions at MetaGeek.com to take your first step towards awesome Wi-Fi because I use Channelizer to actually visualize the spectrum whenever I'm troubleshooting an issue that seems to be coming from maybe a non-Wi-Fi source, for example. And I've also used the Insider Office as a network scanner to figure out what wireless networks are in the area, what channels they're using, and which channels I should use. And just a little tip, you could also plug in your WiSpy DBX and use that with Insider Office to get some channelizer light, for example. You can see some spectrum analysis with Insider Office. Well, anyhow, if you guys are interested, take a look at metageek.com to see what you can do for your Wi-Fi network. Now I was going to ask from a user uh, standpoint, what are your users saying about the network? Are they saying it's working good or are they saying that sometimes you know, it's uh, saturated and cannot be used? And I had another question related to this subject is, uh, you both have uh, you both installed cellular and um, you installed both cellular and Wi-Fi. In terms of statistics, do you see more people connected uh, on the cellular versus the Wi-Fi, or do you see more people connected on, on the Wi-Fi versus the cellular network? Um, so I'll, I'll take your the last question first because I need you to repeat the first one because I don't know if I remember what you said. But uh, the so on the cellular versus Wi-Fi, we don't have the visibility that it gives the MNOs to really understand, um, you know, how many subscribers they have versus how many are on the Wi-Fi. So we assume, based upon numbers the MTA gives us for station uh, traffic, uh, that we are seeing far less on the Wi-Fi than the cellular operators see. Um, it's my opinion, mostly, that, uh, that, that the usage behavior here in the U.S. is a bit uh, 
tilted towards the lazy side. Um, people will not uh, jump on a captive portal to get on Wi-Fi if they only have a few minutes on the platform. Uh, they're less yeah. interested. Um, so they're, they're more uh, interested in having an internet connection no matter where it comes from, even if it costs them money. Obviously, with the unlimited trend, uh, that's a bit debatable at the moment whether it costs them money. Um, so, you know, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a significant number, but it's, I would say that the majority of the heavy lifting happens on the, uh, on the cellular side simply because, uh, um, of, you know, the uniquely American behavior of how we use wireless networks. Yes, I think it makes sense. On on your website, you have you have some stats uh, on you know uh, the age of your users, and it's it's mostly like younger, um, you know, the younger people. So I'm guessing people that don't necessarily have a data plan or something, they will jump on and connect on the Wi-Fi. Um, you know, that's how I I would see it. I guess. Um, my first question was, uh, what's what's the um, what feedbacks do you get from the users? Oh, okay. Um, I mean, everybody loves the uh, the service. Honestly, uh, you know, we were the last major digital divide in the U.S. Uh, within an urban area. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think we can quantify that uh, given the number of users to go through the subway system on a daily basis. Uh, so they went from nothing um, to having Wi-Fi and cellular services, and actually, in many cases, the Wi-Fi uh, last year was up before some of the cellular carriers were in. Because of the turnip process, the carriers uh, have to go through in their, their due diligence. But um, so very, very positive. I've never seen feedback uh, indicating that the Wi-Fi isn't usable. That's not to say that somebody uh, misunderstands where it's designed to work versus where it does work. Um, or sorry, where it's designed to work versus where they think it's supposed to work. So some people believe it's supposed to be on the trains, even though that's not the case and we never claimed it to be. So if they're between stations uh, and there's other call drops or they can't get to their email or uh, you name it, uh, they may get a little irritated. But that's not uh, something we can necessarily uh, control because it's not built in the tunnels. Um, it's in the stations. But I've never, um, to my knowledge, uh, seen anybody uh, complain about, you know, slowness or anything along those lines. Okay, it sounds good. So you mentioned that, you know, obviously you have a... A service of uh, you know free public Wi-Fi for the riders. Um, uh, do do you use do you leverage the the Wi-Fi or the cellular network for other services, um, other companies, maybe the MCA uh, for you know for different services or applications? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know we we have a, a B2B you know or carrier side of the Wi-Fi network that is uh, separate and distinct uh, from a. a from an address space and AAA perspective um, that delivers connectivity to multiple uh, use cases, uh, you know, and this is something that's relatively uh, new to us in the last, say, six to 12 months. Um, but yeah, certainly we see, uh, you know, the MTA is, in, is an increasing uh, number of users, uh, whether it be devices or otherwise, on our Wi-Fi network. And do you... Um, you know what? What about the future? Are you guys uh, thinking of bringing more, I guess, you know, companies or more services onto the the infrastructure? Or do you have any things you can share about the future? Maybe uh, some stuff you're working on. Um, well, I can only uh, I, I, the best way I can answer that is say uh, is say the following. Um, I'm sure we uh, the, the, those of us that are that are wireless engineers or familiar with the mobile industry and mobile uh, mobile networks in general can think of all the exciting things that we'd like to do with a wireless network in the subway system. And, you know, with that in mind, uh, you know, we are very much aware of various different things like that. And, uh, you know, we're a very agile business with a lot of very smart people. So I'd say that there's some interesting and exciting things that will happen in the future, but I can't get into the specifics of it. Yeah, of course it's it's okay. I I, I kind of agree with the uh, uh, with you. I see this as a first uh, like stone, and uh, uh, and then it I see, it it has a lot of potential for future needs. I think um, you know, especially with IoT and all of this coming up, uh, you never know what's you know what's what's uh, the future is going to be be like, and you might need uh, the Wi-Fi or the cellular for something critical in the future, Absolutely. even even underground, right? Absolutely. You know, there's there's about 600 plus miles of track, um, you know, and I believe it's about two thirds of it is underground, like somewhere around that. So 
it's a lot of mileage to cover and there's a lot of interesting, you know, use cases. You mentioned IoT, of course. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, uh, a lot of outdoor, you know, uh, areas to cover, uh, you know, or services that could be delivered. We, you know, our lifeblood of our network is a fiber optic network. Uh, you know, we're yeah. bring, uh, you know, you know, 800 strand play, but 892 strand fiber almost everywhere we go in. Uh, you know, so there's, we're thinking about capacity and uh, other services that can be provided. And whether that be to uh, mobile carriers or direct to the public or the MTA themselves, um, you know, we're, we're very much focused on, on innovation here. And there's a lot of, uh, of, you know, inertia in the industry towards CRAN and other, uh, and, and, you know, and, and front hall and cross hauling even where, you know, and the, the small cells are going to require an immense amount of fiber. And we're in a very, very dense city. And, uh, you know, as such, uh, you know, one who's got the fiber density and that type of uh, business wins. But, you know, given everything, it's like there's a lot of, uh, of, of potential new things in the future that you may not ever see anywhere else in the world or you haven't seen yet that could come out of uh, transit wireless in New York. So, uh, you know, to that end, we'll stay tuned. Oh, yeah, for sure. So it looks like it's been a successful uh, project for you guys, you know, finish uh, two years earlier. Users are happy and everything. Are you guys thinking of deploying the same type of service in other cities uh, in the world? Certainly. Um, so we are uh, our our parent company is a uh, is a company called BAI Communications, um, and we are majority owned by BAI, and we work very closely. Um, Transit Wireless is a bit of an innovation center um, from a global perspective. Um, you know, we have a, a, a number of sister companies across the, uh, the globe, um, from broadcast Australia, uh, in, in Australia, which operates in, in all of the transport and broadcast services for all TV and radio services and much of the public safety from, from a nationwide basis, uh, to RFE, which is an engineering consultancy, which delivers, uh, uh, you know, cellular and, uh, and other types of services like Wi-Fi to the MTR in Hong Kong. Um, to, you know, BAI Canada, who does, uh, Wi-Fi services and some, uh, cellular, uh, through the form of a DAS in, uh, in Toronto. Um, and then, uh, a new project, uh, that came out of an acquisition in Boston, um, for BAI US, um, which is de designed around delivering, uh, light rail services, uh, you know, uh, and, and connectivity onboard trains in the, uh, as part of the MBTA, uh, and their light rail in and around the Boston area. So, um, there's, we're very much focused on, on, on the transportation mass transit to, to you know, a nexus with, with, uh, telecommunications specifically wireless. And that's, uh, you know, we're, we're very well funded, um, you know, in that respect, uh, we, uh, our parent company is a hundred percent owned by the Canadian pension plan investment board. And as such, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're pushing into, uh, you know, In, further into large cities globally, as well into, as into new projects involving connected cities and uh, other initiatives that, uh, you know, are kind of on the uh, up and coming within the wireless industry. So, you know, we do a lot here. Uh, I mean, we were kind of the first in a lot of ways in what we've done within subway uh, and rail environments. And as such, uh, you know, what we learn here, we kind of package and, uh, and, and kind of share, uh, with other organizations and our, you know, other sister companies. Um, for instance, our AP boxes are, you know, were first designed and built, uh, for this network, but they're used elsewhere, um, as well. You know, the, our antenna selection process, all of these things takes a lot, take a lot of engineering, uh, time and, you know, a lot of architectural, uh, ref, you know, reference architectural design and what have you, which is a lot of what I focus on. Um, and as such, uh, we take that and we, uh, you know, we, we, We don't want to reinvent the wheel and we're very much against the idea. Well, uh, not, well, it wasn't built here. It wasn't invented here. So we're not going to use it. Um, and just given the, uh, the uniqueness of New York City and the, you know, the, the special relationship we, we have with the MTA, uh, we've had opportunities to do things, uh, sooner. And, uh, you know, we have an amazing team over here that, uh, really is very much focused on innovation and, uh, and, and being the first to do something that's you know, within our DNA as an organization. So with that in mind, we've been able to, uh, to develop some very innovative uh, approaches to a lot of different problems and, you know, uh, 
you start you'll start seeing those coming to different cities around the U.S. as well as uh, the globe as uh, you know as as time goes on. That's exciting. It's uh, yeah, I like this type of projects. Uh, you know, public transport, uh, city Wi-Fi. It's not it's not easy to to do, and uh, it's something different than than the typical uh, you know office Wi-Fi that we 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 do on a daily basis. Absolutely, um, very much so. And I actually forgot to mention also our we have a an operation in London as well. Um, so uh, sorry, guys, forgot about you. But <laughs> they're uh, they're focused on uh, on the UK's needs as well. But you're right; it's a it's a different uh, world than an enterprise play. Um, you know, um, the carrier Wi-Fi side or carrier communications in general is obviously different than enterprise in many ways. Um, from a perspective of, uh, you know, number one, it's not a cost center. It is the, you know, it is how the money's made in the business. It is a revenue center, which changes the calculus when it comes to how you operate the network and the decisions you make and where you invest and where you don't. Um, but with that in mind, it's also, uh, it's a little bit higher stress and, uh, you know, it takes a certain finesse that I think, uh, you know, is not as, as necessary perhaps, um, you know, from, you know, 24 seven, uh, uh, you know, operating perspective like it is in, you know, versus the enterprise world. I mean, it's an exciting place to be. Yeah. It feels like you're helping the population as well, right? Absolutely. So it's rewarded. you. That's exactly oh. it. That's exactly what, uh, I think a lot of people here enjoy is because it's, uh, you know, you're impacting millions of people's lives in a positive yeah. way. <laughs> I know. I, f I feel like that when I, when, you know, when I work in a hospital or something like that, and it feels like you're doing something special. Certainly. It very much so. Um, so before we close this one, uh, I have a, a question for you. Do you have any like behind the scenes story to share, to share maybe something that happened when you deployed Wi-Fi underground, um, or, you know, something funny to share with us? Let me think about that for a second. Um, well, see, you know, had a, pro a problem with any rats chewing through anything yet. So, uh, <laughs> is good. Um, although, you know, they're, they're definitely very much in tenancy in the subway system. Uh, yeah, they're just everywhere. I mean, it's New York, but you know, if we can get them to work for us, that'd be great. Definitely yeah. a lot. Um, uh, so, one situation I can think of. So, in uh, in Columbus Circle, uh, which is right at, at those of you that don't know New York City, Columbus Circle is at the uh, the southwest uh, corner of Central Park, um, and it's where Central Park West, South, and Fifty uh, Ninth Street and Broadway meet. So there was a large subway station there, one of our 15th largest stations, I think. Um, and there is a new development. The, the MTA is always trying to find innovative ways, innovative ways to use their properties to to better, uh, you know, meet the needs of the public. And they developed uh, something they call a turnstile, which is in essence like a little mall of sorts that's uh, part of it. What used to be just a large hallway in the subway station. And what they did is they, uh, you know, they've got I think 50 or 60 stores in there and you know by the virtue of how our relationship is with the mta we have a license agreement that allows us to use certain frequencies within the uh, um within space um that you know that, that even though it's you know some some of them in the case of wi-fi are unlicensed from a, or part 15 um you know we we still have to have approval from the from the the, just the property owner to use it just like if you had a tower lease for instance you know, you'd still have to mark out what frequencies you're using. It's kind of a first on, first off approach, just like in a tower lease. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, we, with these new businesses coming online, uh, uh, we had all of a sudden an enormous problem with rogues. And uh, so I uh, had one of our able and, uh, and uh, you know, very, very, uh, you know, my right, the guys that are my right hand um, men per se, um, are, uh, which are our field techs. And they uh, went out and, and did a little bit of a rogue hunt for me and identified, I believe it was 117 rogue SSIDs operating. Wow. With, yeah. In a matter of like a couple of weeks, you know, and it, it, uh, it became a situation where you know, the, they were all Verizon files customers, which makes me think if we, uh, if maybe it had taken a different approach and, you know, the business case was there to maybe provide a commercial services. Uh, to these people, we could maybe have a little bit of a say on which channel their, their Wi-Fi network operated on. Yeah. But nonetheless, it uh, you know it added some significant amount of contention to the network um, that was not something we were uh, 
used to seeing underground at least. So I wouldn't say it's the funniest story, but it's uh, it's something that uh, where you know you can't forget the fact that even though you know in, in our world we're in an exclusive space and we are have a uh, an exclusive operating license to you know use certain frequencies that you can't stop people from using Wi-Fi. And yeah. you know, it's like you see uh, you know people that leave their 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 phones uh, hotspot on or have a Wi-Fi in their backpack. Um, you know, we see them moving all around the uh, subway system all the time, you know, and for whatever reason they choose to leave their, uh, hotspot on maybe uh, a lack of knowledge or just ease of use or what have you. Um, I think that, uh, I think that basically, uh, you know, we, that it, that it just creates a additional contention on the network. We see people, uh, I think that it might even be some of the newsstands. I'm not really sure where, but. Or who, but they will attach, uh, you know, range extenders onto our network, and that was uh, that's a bit of a nuisance from an from an operating perspective because you don't want uh, number one range extenders, you know, just not really a, the right solution, um, you know, at any scale outside of maybe somebody's home. So yeah. as such, uh, you know, we see them, you know, jump onto our network and they'll say, you know, transit wireless Wi-Fi underscore ext or underscore ext five G. And we uh, had to come up with an approach to prevent these things. And, you know, we could have taken the WIPs approach and de auth everything, but that probably wouldn't have been the right approach. So um, we just uh, created an access list in, of about 150 OUI ranges and figured that uh, from, our, from our statistical analysis of how many types of devices access the network legitimately, we don't see Netgear OUIs or, uh, or TrendNet OUIs out there that are legitimately accessing. So what we did is, or Linksys for that matter. So what we did is we, uh, we, you know, as I referred to them, neutered the, uh, these range extenders by denying their ability to associate to the network, um, you know, at a global level. And what that did is, uh, in many cases, the range extenders will not, some of them won't come up on the air and start transmitting, but of those that continue to, um, you know, we're just dealing with management frames and the, yeah. the effect is very minimal. Yeah, that's, I think that's the biggest challenge of Wi Fi. It's unlicensed, right? It's not like right. Cellular where you buy your license and you're, you're free to, like, you're the only person to use it. So you can't, you don't have to worry about it much. Oh, certainly. You know, and that's where things like CBRS are going to get interesting. Yeah, exactly. And talking about that, we didn't talk about, you know, private LTE networks, the effect on Wi Fi and, and, uh, you know, LTU, LA, Multifier, and all of this stuff, CBRS. Uh, so would you mind, Jeremy, come back, uh, uh, maybe another, another time for another episode focusing on these technologies? Absolutely. Certainly. Okay. Uh, we, I definitely, uh, uh, have been very, uh, very much looking into that space. So I, I've got a, a few things I'm sure that, uh, we'd, we'd love to share with you. That would be, that would be great. Cause that's something I, I'm not really familiar with or, and I, I know Rowell is, uh, haven't had, you know, haven't worked with it yeah, much either. So we will certainly learn a lot from it. And probably also the, the listeners will learn a lot from you. Uh, if, if you come back on another show. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I just say the headline is, is that, you know, that there's a lot of concern, um, about LA or LTU and, you know, or yeah. even CRS, uh, Obviously, dealing with a different band, but I wouldn't. Uh, I'd say from a an, from a professional's perspective, uh, you know, as a wireless engineer, that you know you don't want to ever get too uh, too pigeonholed. If you can say this uh, about Wi-Fi, but too stuck within one technology. And remember that the that there's going to be need to be engineers that are going to be working on these networks, and those that are in the uh, the Wi-Fi space. As, as as consulting network engineers or otherwise are probably the best position to uh, to hit the ground running, and especially from the uh, you know the business relationships and what have you. And I think it's a really exciting time to get into. And uh, you know, let's not uh, you know I personally don't believe in being a technology evangelist as you know or a puritan in that respect. And I think it's really important to remember that uh, our you know our jobs are to enable connectivity, whether it be for a business case or for the public's use or what have you. Um, and, uh, this is just another way of doing that, that, uh, has a different business model around it. Yeah. It, it might be complementary to Wi-Fi as well. Certainly. And, you know, Wi-Fi is not going anywhere. You know, that's, yeah. a, <laughs> that's not, it's too much, uh, an emotional mass to it for that to happen, but it's going to, you know, there's some things that Wi-Fi is not as good at doing today 
you know, maybe they yeah. the future could be, but uh, that why that LTE is very good at doing, which is like for instance dealing with mobility. Um, you know, that's uh, forward motion is very, very much at the domain of LTE. Oh, for sure. I think I agree uh, with you on this one. I have to know more about LTE though. <laughs> Absolutely, it's, it's a bit different, uh, you know. But it, it, fundamentally, it's uh, there are some uh, some similarities, and you know, it's OFDMA as opposed to OFDM. Although two years yeah. from now, you're still going to be uh, seeing a lot of OFDMA out there once AX wave two. AX, years. yeah. Well, it's kind of like uh, converging a little bit the cellular and the Wi-Fi world. It seems like it's you know converging to the same. I don't know. We'll see what the future will will tell. But uh, it feels like you know. Uh, Feels like the Wi-Fi engineer is becoming, you know, a little bit more like a serial engineer, and then, and then the the other way around too. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think the lines are definitely blurring increasingly by the quarter. Um, you know, I, I the with the work uh, that's been done on AX, I think there's going to be uh, a lot more uh, cellular like, uh, you know, considerations. But you know, the thing yeah. is that. that that the only downside of looking at 802.11 as the way it's evolved is that, you know, in an AX greenfield uh, deployment, uh, which in the public service side of it or public access carrier Wi-Fi side of it doesn't exist, yeah. uh, you know, that you're going to be uh, seeing probably some pretty uh, significant and performance gains. But the thing is, is that it's those legacy devices you got to concern yourself with, you know, yeah. and everything. Uh, for instance, we we still very occasionally see 11G devices on the network. Very, very, very. I mean, less than one tenth of one percent, but they're still out there. You know, and yeah. it's, uh, you know, for them, uh, they might only get a 24 megabit a second connection because that's our minimum basic rate and only enabled to uh, extend uh, rate within 11G. So it's uh, you know, at least in the new part of the upgraded part of the network, um, you're okay if you're on the uh, the 802.11 inside. We give you. A, yeah, standard MBRs, a low MBR six and standard uh, um, extended rates. Yeah, they always they always want to stay backward compatible with the previous versions, so sure. it you know has some drawbacks and overhead and all of this. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, there's at some point you got to make a decision as an as a network operator to uh, kind of uh, you know kind of stop supporting something. Um, you know. And for us, it's a uh, it's a matter of uh, of you know we can't disable G rates. It just doesn't. It's just not tenable. Yeah. Uh, but you know we don't need to uh, dedicate much of our resources on our fifth gen network to those types of devices. You know, and, and, and I mean the numbers speak for themselves. Anyways, we don't see a lot of devices, but we also want to uh, you know obviously a minimum basic rate adjustment is a um, is something that uh, is an optimization, an essential optimization step. So that's something we uh, we do as well. But you know, the uh, I think that uh, you know AX, uh, from what I you know hear through the grapevine, is going to be two uh, different waves, like AC was. And uh, you know, I think wave two is going to be the biggest uh, benefit. Um, you know, and we'll see. Um, have you uh, have you had the opportunity to look at any beta products yet, or what have you? No, not yet. Not yeah. yet. Yeah, I think it might be a few more months before that happens. And if uh, um, I'm very much looking forward to the potential opportunity to to look at some of this this new gear. Yeah, I think the first consumer product came out last week. Um, yeah, some but, consumer yeah. routers came out recently, but no devices. Yeah, no device support. It's like AD, you know, at this point. Although Qualcomm is uh, saying there's going to be AD and. Uh, um, in their 835, um, well, actually, it's already part of the platform, but you're going to start seeing in mobile devices starting towards the uh, third or fourth quarter of this year. And, you know, to, uh, you know, the use case obviously is VR, um, but, you know, or, or multiple HD video screens. But I think that, uh, that the access side of it is just going to be a natural extension of that because, you know, you get to enable a network for VR or for, uh, you know, video casting, but to, uh, you could very easily deliver internet services uh over that as well and you know i think that we would be uh, as an organization very interested in uh, in trying to you know light up a couple of platforms maybe even to deliver uh, you know 60 gigs just to provide a really fast uh you know uh, public internet service or public wi-fi service just to uh just to, just to you know get people's uh you know whet their appetite for it for sure that's a good use case uh I don't know. I don't know how well it would work in a station. I guess you, you guess could test it and, and let us know. 
That's exactly, uh, uh, the, you know, that's why I'd, I'd like to test it and understand exactly that because it's, uh, yeah. you know, it is a definite, uh, it's a different world and than, uh, in a di- far different band. But I think, you know, we get in these advanced beam forming antennas that, you know, and, and we, we, I'm confident, uh, and I've got a little bit of data to back it up that we might be able to light, you know, light up at least a 20 by 20 foot section of platform. Yeah. All right, Jeremy. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show today. Uh, thank yeah, you very thank much you. for spending time with us. Um, before we go, uh, where can people find you online? Um, I'm on Twitter, um, and my Twitter handle is uh, is real Jeremy Ward. So R E A L J E R E M Y Ward. And now I, I had that before dice. I ever knew Donald Trump's handle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i'm on twitter i think i'm connected with uh with you gentlemen as well um okay. awesome and you know i i'm not the big the biggest contributor of uh of twitter messages related to uh to wireless but uh i've i've sent a few things out there before and i think including an analysis i did of uh of the various different ways that devices measure rssi i did some work in the lab on that and uh it was uh it was revealing but um yeah uh it's real r-e-a-l Jeremy Ward, J E R E M Y W A R D. All right. Then, right before we leave, I just want to share a few stats about the network you deployed in New York underground. So I just got that from your website. So, 282 state underground stations, 22 subway lines, 120 miles of fiber, 5.7 million daily riders, 278 active Wi Fi stations, and 10.9 million monthly sessions. On the web. Black, uh, it's actually uh, a little bit more um, than uh, on the fiber side of, by a few miles, and also uh, you said 279 stations active at the moment. Actually, I believe it's 280 now because we had said one more go live mm-hmm. yesterday. Here we go, even better numbers. Certainly, <laughs> and, and one more I can show, I can share with you is our uh, our peak consumption. Uh, in, across the five bor- four boroughs, rather, because we don't serve Staten Island, um, is 24 terabytes. Whoa. So, which the uh, 2017 Super Bowl, I believe, was at 16.2. Wow, that's that's uh, quite a number there. That's impressive. Certainly, and that's that's across 3,000 AP. So it's not really, uh, you know, if you think we, we're pretty confident we're probably the largest high density Wi-Fi network in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can't think of anything that, uh, you know, we rival the Super Bowl, we more than rival the Super Bowl, uh, and we have consistently every year or every day, um, you know. So it's, uh, I know from, uh, you know, if anybody's looking for, a, a, this is not plugging any vendor, I'm vendor agnostic, but, we, you know, we're, we're confident here at least that uh, that uh, Motorola Wing or, you know, Extreme Networks Wing now uh, is very, very capable of delivering the kind of uh, capacity necessary to, uh to in a high density environment, uh, you know, I'm I'm also personally a, a fan of Ruckus, uh, having have built a temporary uh, high density networks and arenas with them, and uh, you know, first concerts and what have you. Um, obviously, their uh, their antenna rays are legendary, I think. Um, but you know, uh, we've uh, we've got uh, you know quite a bit of experience running uh, extreme. You know, we're previously Motorola or Zebra before, you know. Um, they're, they're rapees and, and very, very, uh, you know, happy with it. Uh, you know, it's a matter of just like anything controlling your RF and trusting your vendor too. All right. <clears throat> All right, Jeremy. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And, um, hopefully we can have you on a, on a future AP that talking about LTE and other, you know, other technologies like these. Uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, appreciate it, guys. 